Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, um, good morning, wherever you're listening from. Um, I've decided to start the call learning session once again. Um, thanks to all those who have asked um, and who have pushed that I continue this. However, I think it will be more profitable that I use the YouTube approach, um, do the call learning sessions on YouTube. We could, um, so it could be on demand. You could go watch it at any point in time you want to. And um, I think most importantly, um, that you could also send an email to me asking questions or put your comments. We could like and share and just make it more interactive um, than just having a session on Zoom where we just, um, for the moment, ask the questions and move on. But I think with this, you can always refer to it and um, answer the questions that you, it will answer the questions that you have in your heart that you could ask more questions at your own time. So today I'll be looking at some um, problem solving and I would be looking at it from using a particular tool, which is the A32. Yes, I hope you can see my screen now. Um, yes. So we'll be using the A32 today and I know there are so many tools that we can use for this, so many tools. Um, but today we we'll, uh, use the A32, which is, uh, I think it's one of the most interesting one because it was developed by um, Toyota and they've been able to use it successfully, use it um, to solve problems in which the root cause problem is identified via investigation and um, some measures are used to tackle that root cause. I see it as one of the best methods that I've used um, in a very long time. And uh, it, it helps me better clarify the problem and I'm able to attack that problem um, correctly. So I would definitely recommend anyone who wants to use this um, to use the A3, the A3 method. So uh, let's see what today would look like. We can start. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen. I can bring this down here so it's not in the way. Good. So, um, meet me. I'm Dominic Wambaracha. I have a master's in chemical engineering, specializing in process control, process design, and optimization. I also have an MBA in finance and investment. I wanted to know so much more about how I could transform my technical knowledge into, into money, if I would use that. And uh, I'm also an ISO um, 9001 lead auditor, um, certified Six Sigma associate, um, yellow belt, green belt, black belt, and master black belt. And I have over 10 years experience in manufacturing, in household care, home care, personal care, biopharmaceutical and biotechnology, biotech companies. Yeah, um, 10 years for me. All of what I have learned is what I try to be in, in my videos and in the series, the co-learning sessions that I and to have. So what are we learning today? Our objectives would be to understand a little bit about problem solving, which uh, we've done so much in the past, um, defining the problem. How do we really understand root cause? Um, we'll go through the eight, three steps, um, have some discussions. Mm, an example. I think the example part would do it in a different um, section. Uh, session. Um, so today we'll just understand the E3 steps. I will do another video where we would take an example. I will still bring in some examples in this session where we could um, um, use the E3, um, but we'll have a, a more robust session where we would um, um, take a problem which could be sent in by you 
I could pick any of the problems you, you sent in, or we could do one together and share with the team. You just have to send me an email on d at d my son name at um, gmail.com or yahoo.com, whatever works. What's um, problem solving? It Toyota seizes, and I respect Toyota so much because of their drive for continuous improvement. Um, so I'm all I'm that person who 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 loves the approach to problem solving and continuously improving. As we know, most of all, most of our quality policies um, around our companies always has that line of improvement, right? Um, but Toyota has shown so far over the years that they are committed to this. And if you see the funnel that we have here today, it's talking about a seven step uh, method on how problems can be solved practically. The first is that they initially um, create a perception about, around the problem. So it's the initial problem perception, um, just a small title of what the problem could be. So you understand and they go into clarifying that problem, making the problem look real um, then they do the Gemba. For when we remember when we did the training on Lean, it's Gemba, go to the spot. So you go to the spots, the point of the course, understand that course, the POC, the point of the course, where does it really happen? What is the direct course? We do a 5 y a fishbone analysis, investigate the root cause correctly, appropriately. Once we have been able to identify the root cause, then we apply the countermeasures. The countermeasures or the mitigations are to ensure that this does not repeat itself. If you do not properly identify the root cause, then you do not properly apply a countermeasure, which means there will be a reoccurrence of the deviation or the problem that we're trying to solve. Then you evaluate and standardize to ensure that there's no repeat occurrence and to ensure that someone can also apply this somewhere else or in a different process, in a different field and get similar. What is, how does ASQ uh, standard these days on um, how um, some of our definitions? Um, how does ASQ see problem solving? ASQ sees problem solving as an act of defining the problem, defining the cost, and define, prioritizing, selecting alternatives for a solution. If you look at what I've just read, it's that we see here in this funnel. You define the problem. You determine what the cost would be. That's the POC. You identify, prioritize, select alternatives. That's the countermeasure for a solution. Then you implement the solution. This is what problem solving is all about. Once you can do this, you can boldly say, yes, I have solved the problem. One of our sessions, I think, is pro, um, process quality control. Yeah, who does the seven, st seven steps of QC problems? Right? I gave some tools that we can use at different stages. I'm putting this in here once again so that we could understand the tools that are available for us to solve these problems. Have Pareto, which could be used very effective in selecting a topic or showing um, this is this is what our problem looks like. Pareto is a very wonderful tool. That tells you 80% of the problem comes from here, or 20% of what we're doing is this. And you can properly show a visual representation of your problem. I love visuals. I think when you tell stories, you should use data and visuals. Once you can put the seven steps which you have listed, for example, for Toyota, or this, in visuals at every point, when you want to explain, um, do a root cause investigation and you use the cause and effect diagram, you are visualizing, you are showing them that this, the head of this fish is the problem. The causes are the, uh, like all the skeleton of the fish. It gives a very good visual understanding of what um, the cause and the effect is. We have various graphs and charts we could always apply to, to, to problem solving. It makes life easy. For example, we have, um, we have identified a problem and the graph shows that 70% um, of the time, this is the problem. After you have solved the problem, you need to plot the same graph to show now that 
less than 10% of the time, this is the problem. You can see the visual representation. We had the problem at this height in our graph, and now the problem is this, and we are able to show that there is a 90% drop in the problem or a 86% drop in the problem. This is what um, the non-technical people want to see. It helps them understand all of the jargons that you are presented. Once you use visuals and data, it gives a very good and clear um, um, representation of um, the problem being solved. Why do we even do risk cost investigation? More, um, yes, we want to solve the problem, but we should also understand that it's a regulatory requirement. People, we tell most times no one, not one thing to do with cost investigation, so we already know what the problem is. But please note that FDA, e EMA, um, NAVDAQ, or whatever you have in your country, requires that you have a structured approach to investigation process, to the investigation process that you're using. So it's always advisable that when you are solving a problem that you should use a structured approach. There will always be deviations. There will always be minor, major, whatsoever it is. But it's always advisable that you use a structured approach to solve this problem. So it's not, um, it's not a workload. It's something that should be done. So at any point in time you are being audited by any of the regulatory bodies, they will want to see this. They would want to see what approach you use for your problem solving when you have a deviation, when you have an outer spec, when you have uh, an outlier. How do you manage the, the problem that you are facing? Do you use a structured approach to do this? Your choice could be an A3. Your choice could be just going straight into a volume analysis, but have a structured approach. Today we are using an A3. Maybe when you are done with this session, you love the way the A3 approach is, then you put it into use. Let's go right into it. Why is the A3? What's in it for you? I'm on deviation because you've solved the problem. Once you solve a problem using A3 and you do it correctly, there won't be a recurrence. So you, you have less time on deviations. You have fewer deviations. You are not alone. You work in groups. One of the and one of the things that I love about the A3 is that you have to work in groups because you won't define that problem yourself. You won't clarify your problem, problem yourself. When you do the gamba, they go to the spots, you would meet people. They will tell you, ask them questions. You, when we go through this, you see questions that you should ask at different stages in the process. So, and then I think for everybody, the, the personnel feels good when um, problems are that's one of the advantages that we would always see when we solve problems. Root cause investigations. Uh, why root cause investigations? We're done to find the root cause of an incident. That's why we do it. Because we want to apply the right countermeasure. This is the most important thing. You're not just doing a root cause because you want to design or draw a, an amazing fish bone, but because you want to apply the right countermeasure and you want to prevent a reoccurrence. This is it. And it's, uh, the investigation should be documented. Like I mentioned, regulatory has said, please have a structured approach to problem solving. So document it. Root cause should be seen as an opportunity to improve. You claim in your quality policy that you are for continuous improvement. Please, this is one way to show that claim. This is what our A3 template looks like. Just a one pager in an Excel sheet. Um, if you want me to send you a copy of it, just send me an email, um, D from my first name and all of my last name at yahoo or gmail.com. So it's dwangbaracha at yahoo or gmail.com. You send me an email or you could ask in the comment section, put your email, I'll send you this um, template. So we'll be going through these templates, all seven um, sections, and we'll see how we could use this template. Um, in problem solving. It's a one pager, you fill in all the details and you be happy when you're done that you have solved the problem and you share it with others. And so A3 is original, originally from Toyota, like I mentioned earlier, um, it's true to its origin. The A3 report is one is a one page document, typically five to seven sessions. I have put this, we have eight sessions here. You see why, what the H1 is, but um, we'll go through it. 
and we'll see um, how interesting it is using the, the A3 template. What's the first part? Initial problem perception. This is the part where I say, you put out a simple statement of what the problem is. You see the example I have here. The process is 60% out of spec. Analytical results show that it showed 85 against the targets of 90 to 100, but 60% out of um, out of 60% um, of the time we are out of spec. Just a simple one line, two line um, problem um, def def definition or perception, what you see. So you describe the problem initially, objectively. You say what the incident, uh, you say what the incident observed was. Um, don't be subjective. Don't bring up. It's at this point you don't want to bring up a solution. You just found the problem. So what solution are you proposing? Just define the problem. See what it is. Just one line. I recommend all the time. One line. If it's going into the second line, it should just be at the middle. It just helps you um, say what the problem is. One of my biggest um, 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 successes using the A3 is putting a graph when I define my problem. That's when I do my initial problem perception. I always do everything possible to put a graph at the beginning. Why? Because I want you to understand what I'm saying. I want to be able to tell you that I had 100, um, 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 100 CFU. Um, my target is 100 CFU and for a microbial load or 10 CFU, 10 CFU would be a very good example, 10 CFU and we had 100 CFU were way out of spec. Over the past months, we've always had everything, my graph is here, right? This is my target. We've always had everything below 10 CFU. Today we have 100 CFU. This is the outlier. This is the problem. This is the gap. I want to show you that pictorially so that you are not even interested in reading what my problem statement is. Once you see that, you already understand that, yes, it is clear we have a problem here. And, and most of the times, don't forget, when you're presenting to your problems, um, the problems um, solved, you're presenting to top management who have less time. So pictorials, data would be your best way um, to, to show your problem and how it was solved. So I always encourage that. Um, so what are the checks? What are the things that you need to check that you have done? So you always see this box in all of the slides as we go through because it's something that's very important that you check. Um, you need to check, was my problem perception short and precise? Which is very important because here's what we are talking about communication here. Was it precise, was it concise, was it clear? Was it short and precise? If it was, yes, then you go ahead. Is it, was it data driven? Don't forget what I told you about the graph. Data grieving or visual, one of these, please use it. Was it clear? Is there a clear understanding of the current gap? <laughs> Once you go visual, you know there's a clear understanding of the gap. Then you can move on from this. You have successfully defined or created an initial perception of the problem. You move, move to the second part, which is problem clarification. My advice here is say what you have seen, ask all the questions that you can ask because you want to properly find the problem. You want to properly tell a story about the, around the problem. My style, I will always tell you my tip or my style. My style is a picture or a sketch. One of the um, um, challenge problems I, I solved one time using the world-class manufacturing approach was to do a sketch. So we did a sketch of the problem. So we sketched, I think it was a sachet of detergent and the leakers, and we showed um, the leakers um, using a sketch. And it was clear, this is our problem. Um, at this point, ceiling was bad and there were leakages. So we showed it and now, and this was clear. So if you can take pictures, take pictures, if you can do sketches, do sketches. That already gives the, um, the team you're communicating to, the person you're communicating to, an idea of a clearer picture of what the problem really is. You can put a picture of the problem and the equipment where it happens. Because at this point, you already gathered your information. You've gone 
I always advise at this point to you go to the line to ask all of these questions. It's not something that you sit down with your, with your desk or your office and you just feel. That's why we say that A3 should be done in groups. At every point in time, choose the team, do the session, come together and agree. What are the questions you need to ask here? What happened? Where did it happen? Who was there? What are the instructions? Was there an SOP for this? What is the process? Check the logbooks, check the records. Has this happened before? Ask the personnel, what do you think went wrong? You always had 10 S, 10 CFU when you, um, or even below when you did something at the filling line. Today you have over 100 CFU, what's happening? What changed? You go to the points, you see, we, we, they have the Gemba pass here. Go to the point of the scene and understand and ask the questions from there. What do you think could have gone wrong? What do you think you did differently this time? All the questions, go through the SOP. Tell me what you do and you cross check with what the SOP says. You might be able to find a gap at this point, but write everything that you see, what happened? Where did it happen? In this point, we just want to know, take pictures, lots of pictures. So those who know me, you know, I'll take a lot of pictures because I really want to be able to put the pieces together. Um, when I'm when we are solving the problem, I'll say, okay, but no, but this was there. And um, did we really look at this? And you come back to ask yourself this. Did you go um, do the look and see? Was there a gamba or did you go to the point? Um, if yes, there you go. Has a plan for data collection and studies to clarify the issue be made? If yes, you take it. Initial problem perception be broken down into details and visualized. Features, peripheral, you take. Is the biggest contributor to our initial problem perception now the focus? Take note of this. Is it now the focus? From all that we have gathered, have we been able to say, that what we initially perceived as the problem, is it now the focus of our A3? If yes, then you think it has a good common understanding of the problem. There can be common understanding if, every, if it's not a teamwork. <laughs> you, there's no common when you are the only one doing it. You see why A3 always pushes that it's a teamwork. So there has to be common understanding of what our problem is. Then you think. So I always advise that these questions are good to ask so that you know if you're on the right track using the A3 um, tool. The third part is, we go to the point of the course. Now we are at the crime scene. We're at, we're on Gamba, we're at where it happened. And the pictures you have taken, for those who are very good at sketching, I had a team member then who was very good. But you draw the process flow, you draw, put the, so, so that we can say this is the point. So on raw material, um, uh, uh, filling area, and labeling area, parking area, and all of that. And my point of challenge, right, where I saw um, the high microbial load was the filling area. So I could shade that place or paint it in my drawing as red. That's the point, of course. That's what I want you to identify. This part has to be visual. It could be a service industry, it could be in the bank. Where do you have most of the problem? Oh, people complain the most that um, uh, customer complain, uh, or customer service desk is, um, the officers are rude or they don't respond to us on time. That's the point, of course. That's where it should be shaded red in your A3 um, problem solving chart. Diagram I have here, you can see the point of course here is where you have the box clock. So this is the point of course. You need to add it. You need to draw it and show it pictorial. Once it is drawn and it is shown, I'm going to spend my time describing to those who are listening to me anymore. I'm presenting my challenge, sharing my A3 too. What are the questions we need to ask here? Has the flow chart been used to identify the point of course? Was processing um, mapping examined? Was there a good look see that is the Gemba? Um, has the team identified the step in the process? Are observations and data used to verify the point of course? So not just define it, but do we have data to show that? Yes, this is really the point of course. You can see from the picture here, 
It is really the poor. We have over 10 bags here clogging. Is the filling part really the point of course? So we need to ask questions. How we sure it's from the filling machine? What if the, the, um, the person who is sampling um, sampled wrongly or was the, the source of the contamination? So yeah, so we can identify, then what will help us clarify this would be what? It would be our, um, our root. Our next step here now is immediate correction. That's what I will call it. It's called the temporary. This is what you need to do immediately. You have a problem. Because you don't want a ripple effect one. You don't want um, an effect that could be outgrown. It could just be a spill. And if you don't have an immediate correction, then you have a, a, a blown leak, and which could lead, lead to an explosion and all of that. But immediately you have a challenge. You need to put an immediate correction. If you have to stop the production process, please stop the production process immediately um, before you continue, understand. If you have to... Um, clear out what you have produced, but you need to take an immediate action. So if you see what we have here, what has been, what will be done to prevent the accident spread? What do you need to do to ensure that this deviation does not spread into tens and thousands of what you're producing or what is coming up front? We already have so much um, about to go into the line. Are we? And we just had maybe 300 pieces um, contaminated. Uh, you still have 10,000 on the way. Are you going to just run them in when you're not even sure where the problem is? So immediate correction is stop. The loss um, 300, which we're not sure whether it's a loss or not, it's okay to have that than to have 10,300, right? So there has to be an immediate correction. Please write what the immediate correction is. And said who will solve it? When will this be done? What's the current status? And check the effectiveness. Always important to do that. So has the steam stopped the accident? These are questions you need to ask so that the error is not repeated immediately. Is the containment as close to the point of course as possible? Which is very important. You don't want to do an immediate correction. <laughs> like I mentioned. This is where it happened. I say, oh no, let them continue. Let the line continue running and we'll stop it. But this is the point of course. This is where we should stop it. This is where we need to nip it it here just before it goes into where we have identified a point of course. So it's always very important to do this because we don't want to ripple effects, we don't want to spread, and of course, most importantly, you don't want a safety incident. The fifth and one of the most interesting part is the cause and effect, which the feasible analysis where we which we use here. I, I think I have in one of my sessions that I have done. Um, where I showed us how to use the mini tab to draw a fishbone diagram or to even um, fill in the details in a fishbone diagram. It was amazing. You can go through my videos on YouTube. And at this point, I want to say, please um, like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Of course, I have a lot to, 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 to teach as I go forward. Um, but here, yeah, yes. So the cause and effect diagram is very important here. We want to know what could be the possible causes. This is why it's important that this is done in groups, right? In, in a group. So everybody should brainstorm. Here we want to see all of your ideas. What could man have done wrong? What could machine have, what could have come from machine, from environment, method, material, um, measurement, all of this is what we want to see here. So list them out. What are the possible causes? It, could it be, like I mentioned earlier, could, be, could it be a contamination that has come from man while sampling? It could be, oh, man had not, um, was not trained on sampling and was the cause of the contamination. We could have been thinking, it's possible that yes, the machine was not properly cleaned. That's also the cause. So, but when we list all of this, it could be the last time we do a weekly air sampling and we missed the last one. That's from environment. The methods are not being properly followed when we're cleaning. So list all the possible, everything you could think of. Then we come back and we say, 
how likely is this to have affected it? What I do is I take the red viral. If it is likely, like I mentioned, that um, it could have come, contamination could have come from wrong sampling. Um, then you take it red. It could have come from not cleaning the machine properly, right? We take it red. Um, that's if it's highly likely. If it's possible, but not really, you know. So maybe um, methods were updated and people were not trained. We take it. All of this, we just classify them into highly likely, possible, and no relationships. Of course, people, there'll be ideas that are, and when we sit down and look at it, that there's no relationship between these two. There's no relationship between both of these. It's not possible that it is the raw material because at this point, we already have the finished goods, right? So all of this. So then we take it out. Then ask yourself these questions again. Did both the user and the expert attend the fishbone? Like I mentioned, it has to be team activity. Why are we asking this? Because we need all of the ideas possible. At this point, we want everything. And when we say experts, everyone who should be involved in the process, like we talked about the bank, did we, do we have a um, security guy has to be there? Who watches the camera has to be there? So that we get a perspective that, okay, do we really think the... Um, Customers are the challenge or the customer representative. We need to get the operators. We need to get the, uh, the feeling line operators, the quality team into this to understand why do we have over 100 CFU in place of 10 CFU today? So all of this we want to understand. All of this we want to understand. So all of these questions we need to ask. And once you ask them and you are able to um, prioritize, which is highly likely, which is possible, where, where there's no relationship, then we can confidently say, okay, we can move into um, a YY uh, um, analysis. So we should be able to, what I see here is you should be able to have these categories, the six of them, which we have mentioned, uh, man, mat material, machine, method, environment, brainstorm, like you see what I wrote here, all the crazy ideas, all leave nothing um doesn't like we always say there's no stupid question put them all we will feel that once you feel that you find out that you are over 90 percent closer to what the the cost um, could be now what we do with the cost investigation is you like they highly likely ones right you list them what you have identified, for example, we have identified that um, um, the contamination from the machine because the last air sampling was not done or last um, machine um, bio burning sampling was not done. Then we put it as, as highly likely, right? And we say, okay, possibly possible, we put possible as um, contamination coming from the person who sampled, right? So we put all of those in her. How are we going to investigate that? You have, that's what we need to write. How are we going to investigate that? We investigate it by checking all the, the past results of the machine um, biotech checks, the microbial checks. We'll check by asking the, the person who sampled, how did you sample? Have you been trained on sampling? Um, the person says, no, I've not been, I, I was trained on sampling. Which SOP were you trained on? Oh, SOP 0 is everything. Oh well, no, there's an SOP 004 now. So, oh no, I don't know that they've updated the SOP. Then that's what we have found. We have found that the sampler, the QC analyst or QC Mibio analyst um, was trained on SOP 003 and there's a new SOP 004 where the QC was not aware of it, right? So all of this is what we need to put into this. Now, what will our results be? For all of them, we need to say, uh, there's no relationship here. Yes, I think if the QC analyst is now aware of the new SOB, it could contribute. So put the triangle. If the um, equipment that was used for manufacturing um, had a load that was close to, um, close to um, well, maybe at the, at the mark 10 and was ignored, you know, when previously, so I give you a very good example. We have micro loads always below five. And in the past three weeks, we had seven, we had six, 
and now we have 10. And the next time you had 100, it means there was a change, right? There was a change, um, something had changed and no one checked, did the, um, the out of event investigation or the out of, um, it's not an out of specification, right? It's an out of, um, it's an out of event investigation or out of trend, sorry, uh, yes, out of trend investigation. Um, that's why we now have an out of specification because if the out of trend had been monitored or checked or evaluated, then we would not be having the out of specification today. So these are the things that we need to put in this instance. So all of this is what we need to um, write in our investigation um, approach. Then we take it to the YY. You take those ones you've put in a triangle and you write them here. Why was the sampler, the QC analyst not trained on the new SOP? Nobody checks if um, after an SOP has been written, um, that's the SOP of uh, SOP or SOP for training does not mention that a retraining should be done when an SOP is reviewed. All of this, why is it not written there? You write it. So you keep writing the whys until you've answered the question. And that's what we can put as a key root cause. Why was an OOT not done? Because the analyst felt there's no SOP, it could be that there's no procedure on handling OOT, or nobody even knows what the OOT is. You get that um, still we didn't spec. Why should we worry? Do you understand? So all of this will drive down now to what the root cause is, and then we can place a countermeasure around it. You can see here we already seen two possible causes. One, the analyst has not been trained on a new method. Something has changed in the method, and it was not been trained. It has been a change in the results or the um, bioburning or the microbial load and nobody took note of this out of trend. I, I, you get it. So this is what we need to put here as a um, root cause. And once we do this, once we fill this chart, which is the five Y chart, uh, I think I also have a session where I talked about five Y. And I think it's something we also need to look at in the future again. It's a very interesting approach to problem solving because by the time you've asked the why, most times we find out that in the third why you already have answers to this problem. Then we ask ourselves these questions. All the because. In the previous, we have the because here, right? Because so when you ask the why, why was there overload? Because is some the QC analyst um, sampled with the wrong with the, with the wrong equipment or the wrong sampling flask or whatsoever? Why did he sample with the wrong one? Because it was not trained. Why was it not trained? Because it was not aware. Why was it not aware? Because the SOP had been changed. Why was the SOP changed without the QC being aware? Because there's no procedure saying that this is what uh, that the SOPs um, reviewed SOP should be, people should be trained on reviewed SOP. Why was that not there? Because the SOP, there was no SOP on training talking about. You, you, you get it. So we are digging deep. The because helps us. So once we have confirmed what the because with facts, we think um, is the five five perform together with users and expert always important. Like we mentioned, it they should be done in groups. SMEs must be available. Um, is every because transferred directly as next why without twists? You need to check. Move the because. You said it is because it was not trained. You remember, I, I took it, why not trained? <laughs> you understand? It needs to be like for like. So has have we had at least three whys being used? And has at least one root cause been identified, which is the general um, characteristics of the system? So all of this you need to put in your checklist and... Um, apply, um, once we have this check, then we know, yes, we are on track. So these checklists are also one of the most important parts of um, the aid. Once we have been able to identify our root cause, you know, now we can say this is the solution and uh, we can put a countermeasure, sorry, we can put a countermeasure on those root causes and identify a solution to prevent the reoccurrence. So we put a countermeasure and say, who will do it? When will it be done? 
status and the effectivity. Always very important that we do an This is what I advise. That's why I, I, I love um, um, systems where there's an effective check, maybe after one month, three months, and we come back to say, have we applied the right countermeasure? So we don't have a reoccurrence. Deviations that have reoccurrence um, just shows that we didn't do a proper root cause analysis. And one thing I always do at the end of the month, so the quarter, I plot my um, deviations and I see how many reoccurred. We go back and we check the root cause. We have not done the job. So we need to go back always to check, see what, how many reoccurrences we have and see what have we not applied correctly. So have all solutions been implemented? Questions we need to ask ourselves. Has the effect of the solution been measured and the process confirmed? Hierarchy of control are all solutions based on the strongest possible action to prevent the occurrence. When we put solutions, we should make them as easy as possible to understand. That's why we put Pokayoke here. So it is very important that it's easy to implement, easy to understand, easy for people to, um, to carry on. So a lot of uh, countermeasures should be solute corrections. Don't forget, corrections should always happen as the first thing. So you should have corrections in front so that we don't have a repeat occurrence, uh, so a um, ripple effect, something which will now move into an accident. And put corrective actions, preventive actions, um, containment could still be present. You either remove them or you leave them while you are implementing effectiveness check is the most important for me. What measures are we controlling that the countermeasures, you see that the countermeasures are solid. So please, effectiveness checks are very important. Always have them, always have them. Then the most, I told you there was an eighth part and this eighth part is that you share the knowledge. Please always share your findings, share your solutions share your learning. While doing the A3, you've learned a lot. Share it. Put the team together, in groups, your small team, and say, this, I, we had this problem last week. We had a question on this slide in one of your meetings. I said, let me just take two to three minutes to share with you what we did. I always do this because I can do it in two to three minutes. Like, don't forget, because it's more pictorial, you are able to share it, right? So you, once you have the A3, interestingly, I print it on an A3 so that I can, you know, I can show all of that, right? And you share with the team, the team understands. And they, if, they, if they have suggestions on your approach, they'll tell you, they give you feedback. Oh, why didn't you just do this? And you could learn better, you know? So it's always good to share. This is the eighth part, like I told you. you know, it's usually five to seven, but the eighth one is share. Could the problem exist in other areas and have relevant persons to be informed? That's why one of our um, um, policies where I work is uh, that we learn, uh, we learn from mistakes. No one is blamed for mistakes because if you're blamed for mistakes and you hide them, um, then no one ever learns from you. People keep making that mistakes. So we, we push a culture where you share your mistakes. Like, so we, I don't have to make the mistake you made. So it's always encouraged that we share our, our A3 you share the problem that you have solved and um, yeah, it helps others. So I'll be very glad if someone shares a problem that we could look at together. You could book a time with me, send me an email, say, oh, can we do this A3 together? And maybe that's what we will share in the next session and um, people could learn from it. So I'll be happy to get mails from you, from anyone to talk about the A3. I'll be really glad. Um, if you have questions, please just write it in the YouTube comment section or send me an email, like I said. And yes, thank you very much for listening. In my next session, we'll be looking at a practical example, maybe one that you will share with me that we should solve together. I'm very open. I'm happy to help. I want to increase learning. So happy to have a session with your team. You will brainstorm and solve a problem. Put it on the A3 and template. Also happy to share this template. You just send me an email and I'll share with you. We would um, continue. So thank you very much. And please like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I would do this more often now.
um, so that we can all grow in learning and understand what this is about. I hope you enjoyed and you learned something today about A3 as a tool for problem solving. Thank you very much. My name is Dominic Wangbarocha. It's nice meeting you. Cheers.